Hi, welcome to iRebel on the Voluntary Virtues Network. I'm Meredith, and I'm here with Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Meredith. And we thank you for joining us today. Um, so this episode is somewhat special because we're going to address a specific argument that somebody posed to us. So, uh, and this might be old hat for most of our audience, um, but if you're like me, you'll probably enjoy hearing a fellow voluntarist answer this particular question. I, I like to do that. Uh, so here's the deal. My, my daughter recently had a conversation with a very close and respected friend over gun control, and she argued that gun control goes against the non-aggression principle, which yay for my daughter. Um, but he argued that without gun control, more children would be killed by guns. Um, so, and honestly, I think this is a valid concern. Uh, so it seems to me that if you show someone the non-aggression principle and you explain it to them, and they still insist that gun control is necessary, um, I think they're coming from a position that it's okay to initiate force to take someone's gun away if it's going to save the lives of children, which I mean, that seems to me like a valid argument or, you know, a, con a valid concern. And I can appreciate it. Uh, you know, not many people are okay with children dying, and I'm certainly not. Uh, so we're going to explore the subject from a voluntarist point of view. Um, and this is interesting as a side note. Uh, normally, I'm sure many of you and us too would say that gun control isn't actually gun control because the police still have guns. Um, but this friend of hers lives in England, and in England, police officers on routine patrol don't carry a firearm. So that's something. So we're going to take a look at the voluntarist view of gun control. Uh, voluntarists have a long view that envisions a society without a coercive government, a society that understands the importance of, individual and, of individuals and the protection of property rights. Individuals or groups of individuals will cooperate and meet all their needs, including their need for safety and protection. This view requires an understanding of the true nature of humans, an understanding that is backed by science not fear-mongering by the media, politicians, schools, or any other institution that relies on the need to control others. Humans are capable of good and bad. We know that, no doubt. But it's not a case of bad apples as much as it's a case of a bad barrel. The world we live in now is not a good barrel. In fact, it sometimes seems that everything is upside down and backwards. Voluntarists understand that through peaceful, voluntary, cooperative interaction and trade, with no coercive, oppressive political institutions and laws, the apple barrel would improve, and there would be far less bad apples. When violence is not incentivized or institutionalized, most violence goes away. This is the human nature voluntarists understand. But while we work at spreading ideas and understanding that would hopefully lead to a changing world, Non-coercive people need the means to defend themselves against the bad apples. In other words, the people that are not peaceful. Most states or cities in the U.S. have restrictions against gun ownership and use. This is under the assumption that these restric restrictions or laws will keep guns out of the hands of bad guys or criminals. In reality, these laws do little to keep the guns out of the hands of violent criminals and do everything to keep peaceful individuals from owning guns. This leaves the good people at the mercy of the bad guys and the armed officials of the state or the police. Gun control laws make the lives of criminals easier by depriving the potential victims of crime of a means to defend themselves, their friends, loved ones, and their property. Most people rely on the police or military to provide protection. But when this is really considered, it's just not the reality. The police are not capable of proactively protecting individuals and property. In most cases, the police are quite a few minutes drive away from you and your property, and as one of our favorite voluntarists, Larkin Rose, so clearly phrases it, when you call 911 because of a threat of bodily harm or theft of your property, you call because you want a good guy with a gun to show up to protect you or your property from a bad guy with a gun. You are a good guy and have the ability to own and operate a gun for your protection, even if you personally don't like or want a gun. You benefit from other good gun owners that may reside near you or be in your vicinity in the event that you are faced with a bad person with a gun that wants to harm you or your loved ones or your property. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, what we really have to do is weigh the consequences of having a state against the consequences of respecting and upholding the equal authority of each individual, uh, in this case to have guns. Um, if we look at it this way, violence inflicted by private citizens pales in comparison to institutionalized violence basically institutionalized violence is the state. So uh, this brings up us to the concept of democide. Um, so what is democide? According to Wikipedia, um, democide is a term revived and redefined by the political scientist R.J. Rummel as the murder of any person or people by their government including genocide, politicide, and mass murder. But importantly not including war. This is the number of people killed by government, not war. Uh, so Rummel created the term as an extended concept to include forms of government murder that are not covered by the term genocide and it has become accepted among other scholars. According to Rummel, democide passed war as the leading cause of non-natural death in the 20th century. Uh, his, research, his research shows that the death toll from democide is far greater than the death toll from war. Study after, study, er, after studying over 8,000 reports of government-caused deaths, Rummel estimates that there have been 262 million victims of democide in the last century. According to his figures, six times as many people have died from the actions of people working for governments than have died in battle. Political mass murder grows increasingly common as political power becomes unrestrained. At the other end of the scale, where power is diffuse, checked, and balanced, political violence is a rarity. According to Rummel, the more power a regime has, the more likely people will be killed. This is a major reason for promoting freedom. Rummel concludes that, with, that concentrated political power is the most dangerous thing on earth. On his website, uh, which is interesting, uh, Rummel states, just to give perspective on this incredible murder by government, if all these bodies were laid head to toe, with the average height being five feet, then they would circle the earth ten times. Also, this democide murdered six times more people than died in combat in all the foreign and internal wars of the century. Finally, given the popular estimates of the dead in major nuclear war, this total democide is as though such a war did occur, but with its dead spread over a century. So uh, we're going to link the website to R.J. Rummel's, or to R. J. Rummel's website um, if you want to look that over uh, okay. when we're done. Yeah, we're going to put a lot of links, I think, in this one. So definitely be sure to check out the links. Right. or all the sources and even some other interesting videos that might be of interest after this presentation. Uh, so there's an article I'd like to read and share with you um, from Lou Rockwell by Eric Peters it's called If Guns Are Bad. Mm -hmm. If guns are bad, how come? All politicians, including dear leader Bloomberg, are surrounded by heavily armed guards. There is never a mass shooting at a police station. There is virtually no gun crime in Switzerland, even though the Swiss are armed to the teeth with full auto military combat rifles in the hands of nearly every adult male between the ages of 18 and 45. Guns save so many lives each year, including most recently the lives of numerous potential victims of a mass shooting in Oregon at the Clackamas Town Center Mall, where concealed carry permit holder Nick Melly confronted armed killer Jacob Tyler Roberts who had already shot two people dead and prevented him from shooting more people dead. Rural, er rural areas tend to have high concentrations of guns relative to urban areas, yet gun crime is inexorably higher in urban areas while it is almost non-existent in the rural areas. Concealed carry permit holders are less likely to be involved in an unjustified non-defensive shooting than a cop. The Obama administration walked 2,000 high-powered rifles to Mexican drug cartels. Some advocates of sensible gun control argue that no one needs, take your pick, a semi-automatic pistol or rifle, which means virtually all pistols and rifles that aren't single-shot derringers and bolt-action rifles, or a high-capacity magazine or a weapon over a certain caliber, which has a certain threatening to some appearance. 
even if its function is identical to a rifle with a less menacing appearance. Well, who really needs more than 50000 a year to live on? Or more than 800 square foot dwelling? Does anyone need more car than is sufficient to get from A to B at the posted speed limit? Who really needs anything beyond the bare minimum necess necessary to maintain one's physical existence? Who needs to live to be older than 80? Who needs to have more than one kid? Do you really need a 40 ounce drink? Or more than one drink of soda per day? How many calories per day does one need? Oh, but guns are different. Not really. And the principle behind that argument is identical. If need is to become the justification for allowing us to do or possess, or possess things, then we are already enslaved in our minds. And soon we will be enslaved physically and utterly. From each according to his abilities, to each according to his needs. This famous statement is left hanging. The need is never qualified. Need according to whom? Inevitably, need will be defined by those who wield power. And if it is accepted that firearm ownership should be restricted based on need as opposed to something someone has actually done, the restrictions will not end with guns. That is the principle at stake here. Needs versus rights. In a free society, the individual's natural right to decide for himself what his needs are is respected and codified into law. You may think the guy next door is an idiot for living in a 4,000 square foot home when it's just him and his wife. What does he need that for? You may say to yourself. Just as he may say to himself, what does that guy need all those rifles for? Just as the guy down the road wonders why the guy across the street needs all those old motorcycles. After all, he can only ride one at a time. But each to his own. It's just a more everyday way of stating what Jefferson stated with greater eloquence. The pursuit of happiness. To be free to choose. To not have others choose for you. To live as you, not your neighbor. Not some politician. See fit. So as long as you do, as long as what you do isn't causing someone else harm, and it causes no harm as such for a man to own a powerful gun or a powerful car, or to live in a large house, or to enjoy working on old motorcycles, to pursue his happiness. In an unfree society, a society such as the one America is rapidly becoming, the individual's needs are defined by others, by those who have power, by those who possess guns by denying others right to own a gun because they have decided they need guns but others the others being whomever they so classify do not just as they will if this business goes the wrong way shortly begin to decide that no one needs to have more than a certain amount of money or a certain kind of car or so much house or more than X number of children and so on without end without limit because need is ultimately undefinable it can mean anything anyone wants it to mean. And if those with guns decide you don't need a gun, they will feel free to decide you don't need other things as well. Depend upon it. Need is the intellectual, moral cup of hemlock being offered to the American people. We'll shortly see how many decide to take a sip. Throw it in the woods. Okay. <laughs> that was awesome. So, um... At this point, we're going to look at just some empirical data that we found about guns. Um, it's not really conclusive either way. We're just going to throw that out there. Um, so the first one is uh, gun ownership is highest where violent crime is lowest. So that's interesting. And increased gun ownership follows increased crime rates. Uh, higher gun ownership has no net effect on rates of violence and crime. Uh, so having a swimming pool in a household is something like 4.3 to 5.6 times as likely to lead to an accidental death as having a firearm when we look at the numbers for all age groups. For children less than 15, the difference is more like 19 to 25 times as likely. So if we're not going to ban swimming pools, then we really shouldn't ban guns. Um, not like I want to ban swimming pools. That's <laughs> don't want to put that out there. So uh, I have some statistics comparing violent crime in the in England uh, to the U.S. But as a caveat, uh, I just want to point out that it's really difficult to get a true comparison because of the different ways that these statistics are measured in each relative country. Uh, so with that said, the following data seems to represent the most common analysis. So according to the FBI, there were 1.2 million violent crimes committed in the U.S. during 2011. 
Um, according to the UK government, there were 1.94 million violent crimes in the UK during 2011. So there were almost exactly five times as many people in the US as in the UK. Thir um, three, <laughs> 314 million versus 63 million. The violent crime rate in the UK is 3,100 per 100,000 people, and in the US it's 380 per 100,000 people. So Brits are eight times more likely to be victims of violent crime than Americans. Uh, so there's that. Um, that's interesting. Like I said, it's not super conclusive because there really is no way to know for sure because they measure it differently. Um, so here is another interesting data point. These are the leading causes of death among children. Uh, accidents are by far the leading cause of death among children and adolescents. There are almost twice as many deaths in the first year of life than there are in the next 13 years total, which is sad. Mm -hmm. And then the death rate rises rapidly following puberty because of the large number of deadly accidents, homicides, and suicides in the 15 to 24 year age group. Uh, the automobile accounts for the largest number of these accidental deaths. Um, so make sure that infants and children use the proper child seats. <laughs> and mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's important. And other top causes of accidental deaths are drowning, fire, falls, and poisoning. So it's car accidents, drowning, fire, falls, and poisoning. Those are the top causes of death. Um, so, yeah, and we don't see people calling to ban cars. No. Um, Matches. Yeah. Not that these things aren't a problem, you know. It, yeah. It's, I mean, it, it, we like we said in the beginning, nobody wants children to die. It would be great if we could just lessen all of the causes of death of, of children and kind of everyone, actually. Yes. Um, yeah. So uh, with that said, um, we are going to sort of give some examples uh, of some voluntarist solutions or in a society that ideally does not have a state what would solutions look like how would we fix this if we didn't have these uh, you know if we didn't have gun control um, so hopefully we establish that it's better to respect the freedom of private citizens to own guns than it is to regulate them but there are still concerns when it comes to owning firearms so we're going to give some examples of ways to address these concerns in a stateless society and the first thing that we must say is that we don't know how these problems will be solved uh, we're not central planners and we're against central planning that's our whole thing <laughs> so these are simply suggestions and educated guesses in a stateless society everyone would be free to choose their own solutions improve on old ones and continually innovate absolutely historically free groups of people and individuals have been able to protect themselves very well against violent crimes the prosecution of victimless crimes results in treating non-criminals like criminals thus essentially making criminals and taking away a person's agency and ability to provide essential needs, including protection for themselves and their family. If you're convicted, if a person's convicted of a felony, their right to carry a gun or the ability to obtain the right to carry a firearm, I think, is um, eliminated um, forever, uh, as well as voting. Um, I mean, there's other things, other ways that just by prosecuting people for victimless crimes and putting them into that system just creates more problems. Those people are are um, not given the agency to, to do, do those things for themselves. Uh, ending wars. Nothing ruins a perfectly productive and responsible person like war. The mental trauma and the physical trauma on the men that fight wars has consequences that last long after the war is over. Mm -hmm. Education. It's important to educate ourselves on issues we feel strongly about, especially when choices we may advocate based on feelings and emotions may have unforeseen negative consequences. Many people, once educated in gun ownership and operation, change their feelings about gun ownership. The old mm -hmm. adage run towards what you're afraid of. Yes, I love that. And it's true. And I feel like if if people were had more education when it comes to guns, they, they realize that guns are a tool. Um, 
and and they would feel more comfortable around them and would know how to handle them properly and how to teach their kids to handle them properly and it, you know I, I think more than gun control a culture of educated people <laughs> would would lessen accidental deaths um, by guns um, and so one of the main or, or the main uh, problem solvers with everything is technology so um, guns are a technology right uh, mm -hmm. and I was trying to think of different ways that technology could help out with this issue with accidental deaths by guns and um, I thought of a few uh, the first thing I that came to mind were, were force fields you know what if uh, at some point they came up with you know something you hit a button and shoot you get a force field um, in front of you or a shield some something like that that would be cool or um, you know, what if we surpass guns altogether and we come up with phasers like on Star Trek so we can set it to stun <laughs> and it's just a little device and, and, you know, then guns would sort of become obsolete. I'm sure actually it wouldn't even have to be a phaser. I'm sure there are tons of things that I can't think of that lots of other people would think of that could be more safe and efficient than guns. Um, and then another quick uh, thing I thought of was either retina scanners or fingerprint scanners on either the guns or, or both the guns and the safes uh, so because part of the problem is people don't want to lock their guns in safes because if somebody breaks into your house you don't want to be messing with the safe to get out your gun so that's kind of like a paradox there um, so what if the safes just had uh, retina or fingerprint scans on them and and even you know one step further would be to have a gun that would have a retina scan on it so like it's your gun you're the only one that can use it and that would actually take care of all kinds of problems all kinds of them and you know that would be a way to know whose gun it is right <laughs> because right. you know only one person would be able to use it so that would be awesome mm -hmm. um, and those are the, you know, a couple of things I thought of. Um, right. Help. I also just want to say, in the, on the topic of technology, that um, I think it's important to uh, point out that because of technology, we now are in in a we're at a point where uh, the manufacturing of guns is out of the hands of big manufacturing. You can make your own printable gun. So gun control may be just moot anyway because the technology has been released, it's been open sourced, anybody can download the plans to 3D print their own gun. That's a really good point. I didn't think of that I but know. I mean and, and I figured I would because I always think that if one person has a gun, just one person, then everybody should be able to have a gun just because it's that kind of tool. So. Um, so, you know, it's possible that in, in the, you know, near future that gun control just won't work anywhere. It just right. is, isn't a viable option. So we're going to have to look at these nonviolent solutions, um, you Excellent. know, and that's good, yeah. And that's so, just us using our imagination. I mean, right. use yeah. yours and come up with your own mm -hmm. and your own world. Mm -hmm. Right, and and actually that's how it would work. Everybody, you know, comes up with their own solutions. Everybody who's who's got a vested interest in it, and uh, everybody who's able to innovate or you know create yeah. things that are safer will, and uh, the market will decide, and right. that's the way it works. Right. Yeah. So. In conclusion, <laughs> I hope this was helpful for the person who answered the, or who asked the question in the first place, or he didn't actually ask a question; it was an argument. But I hope I hope this helps my daughter, and uh, and anybody who watches it to really understand what voluntarists think about gun control. It's not that we don't care; uh, it's that you know the state is actually worse <laughs> worse than private citizens, and it's important that you that that everyone's able to keep their own rights intact. Um, so, uh, in conclusion, in an article titled The Death of Minarchism, uh, Jeffrey Tucker writes, step back and ask the fundamental question, 
Why is the state necessary? Why do we have to pay all these taxes? Why must we constantly defer to its power? Why must we adore its leaders and pay homage to those who die for it and raise our children to adore its history and works? What is the point of this gigantic contraption that lives in our midst and at our expense? These questions are at the heart of the philosophy of politics, economics, and the social order. How they are answered determines what kind of world we live in. So if we want to live in a world where children aren't killed by guns, then we must first get rid of the biggest gun of all, the state. Yes. Perfect. <laughs> I don't know if we could say anything better than that. Yeah, I think that's kind of the bottom line on the situation. And and actually, really, I mean, this is, I love this quote from Jeffrey Tucker. I, I really invite people to try and actually answer this question. Yeah, um, if, if you answer the questions, then you can kind of see how you want your world to be. That's right. So this has been iRebel on the Voluntary Virtues Network. I think we're out of time. Yeah. So great to talk to you again, Meredith. I yep. enjoy it. <laughs> it's been and, really uh, fun. Yes. Remember to check the links. We're going to put lots of links in the bottom of this one. So thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.